1981, eight fighter jets are spotted in the skies over Baghdad, preparing to attack. Their target, the pride and joy of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. It was one of the most important military surprises of all time. As the jets dive at their target, stunned Iraqis stare in disbelief. The insignia on the wings is the Star of David, the symbol of the Israeli Air Force. How could Israel strike from such a great distance without detection? It was something that has not been done before. For more than two decades, the Israelis have kept the details of this unprecedented mission a closely guarded state secret. We were not able to penetrate Israeli intelligence to gain any heads up about a potentially aggressive action against the reactor. But now, Israel has released these classified documents, and for the first time, the mission's officers, architects, and pilots can finally tell their story. There was a lot of uh, firing from the ground, a lot of firing. You see every bullet, and each one of them, that it's for you. It was an attack that shocked the world. I could hear the president. He said, they did what? This is a story of international espionage, blackmail, and targeted assassinations. A story of one of the most daring and dangerous military operations ever attempted. The story of Israel's raid on the reactor. It is early in June 1981. Despite relative peace between Israel and the Arab world, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin gives the green light for a top secret military operation to proceed. Moments later, eight F-16 jets taxi down the runway of a secret Israeli airbase in the Sinai Desert, carrying a weight that exceeds nearly twice the design specs of the aircraft. With the additional weight, the jets struggle to get airborne, but do so with precious little runway left. Finally, after years of secrecy, planning, and espionage, a mission that could determine the very fate of Israel is underway. I felt that it is the future of the state of Israel on my shoulders, yes. Many of us were, were, were grandsons or sons of people who had been through the Holocaust. And we had been a part of a mission that was to prevent uh, another Holocaust. The planning of the mission, dubbed Operation Opera, had been underway for over three years. But right from the start, Prime Minister Begin and his staff were hoping, even praying the raid would never have to take place. We decided to put the kind of a red line, if you can call it a red line, saying that we'll continue to try all kinds of diplomatic efforts. Means using the military force only as a last resource. What was this threat to the Jewish state that had the Israeli government so concerned? What enemy had the capability to strike this kind of fear in the hearts of a recognized military power? The answer laid nearly 600 miles to the east in Baghdad, Iraq, home of Saddam Hussein. An article appeared in one of the major Baghdad newspapers uh, saying that they would have a nuclear bomb to neutralize Israel. In his 1987 bestseller, First Strike, Israeli author Shlomo Nachtimon describes a nightmarish scenario that in 1981 was all too real. In the skies over Tel Aviv, an unidentified Boeing 707 is spotted approaching from the sea. All of a sudden, a huge dark object falls from underneath the airplane's wing. Would Saddam actually have used the nuclear bomb against Israel? Knowing Saddam Hussein, uh, I think you have the answer. It's very obvious that this was a man that, who, who cared very little about human life and the values that uh, dominate Western democratic societies, and that included Israel. And they were dedicated to the destruction of Israel. He uh, published a statement to the Iranian people telling them 
that this uh, nuclear capability is not going to be used against them. This is what we're talking about in the time of war uh, with Iran, but against the Zionist uh, entity. With three bombs, there could be at least a half a million, maybe 600,000 Israeli casualties and the destruction of their major cities. Whatever Saddam's intentions were, he knew Iraq did not possess the resources necessary to develop a nuclear weapon. What his country did have in abundance was oil and billions in cash to spend. So, armed with these two irresistible commodities, Saddam went shopping for a reactor and quickly found a supplier, French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac and the French government. Chirac uh, and Saddam Hussein had become quite close and uh, had struck a contract whereby France would build this nuclear reactor France charged him $200 million. He bought Mirage jets and uh, 7,000 Renaults. <laughs> I was interested in that story because it was too good to be true, uh, too nicely, too clean, too... Everything was, was too perfect. Jean-Pierre Van Gert is a renowned French investigative reporter famous for uncovering government secrets and scandals for over 40 years. It was Van Gert who first broke the story about the questionable dealings between France and the notorious dictator. During his investigation, he also uncovered possible evidence that Saddam had induced and enticed French officials to cooperate. The French official got back from Iraq oil, contact in the Middle East, and they got money. <laughs> When the agreement was announced in 1975, the French government defended their actions. The facility would be purely a civilian reactor, used for energy purposes only. While many accepted this explanation, there were those who doubted the rationale. Here was a nation that didn't need energy resources, didn't need nuclear energy, uh, run by a nefarious thug, a killer. Uh, and what could one properly assume? Publicly, he claimed that this is for energy, for uh, capability of uh, scientific, peaceful uh, goals. Privately, we know from scientists who worked, their goals were based on the assumption that two to three uh, bombs will demolish the state of Israel, and those were the numbers that uh, they were working on. Everybody knew the real meaning of that construction would have been a military purpose. Within weeks of the announced agreement, construction on the reactor began just outside of Baghdad. Saddam named the soon-to-be-built reactor after the Babylonian month of Tammuz, the very same month in which Nebuchadnezzar began his assault on the Jewish people in 586 BC. But these developments failed to raise concerns by any nation other than Israel, who regarded the situation with pessimistic trepidation. Obviously, satellite photography was providing uh, data on, on the construction of a, of a reactor. I recall having seen it, uh, or mention of it, during the transition from the Carter administration to the Reagan administration. But I don't recall that we paid any particular attention to the progress of that reactor, nor were we particularly alarmed by it. There was no attention given to it. Having verified the capabilities of the reactor through several international independent sources, Prime Minister Begin found himself with only one option. Set into motion a plan, either through diplomacy, espionage, or military action, to stop the reactor from going hot. He then tasked the head of the uh, IAA to search out several possibilities of how they could go about neutralizing this. And that's what began this whole mission. As the eight Israeli F-16 fighter jets clear the runway, they streak towards their target. Within minutes, they are within Jordanian airspace. As planned, the pilots then descend to an unthinkable altitude of only 100 feet above the ground. 
kemi din pond rodo the enemy rodo to see us not in Saudi Arabia not in Jordan and not in Iraq of course then as they approach the Gulf of Aqaba disaster strikes and they flew right over uh, this beautiful yacht King Hussein of Jordan's yacht and he looked up and saw eight Israeli fighters heading east right above his yacht which of course was shaking and he figured out immediately what he's all about he's, so he, he called his officer on the ship to call Quran Center in, in Amman to tell the brothers that the Israelis are coming to knock up the reactor the pilots, unaware of the potential danger below, proceed on course. They initiate radio silence and will continue this way until they are ready to attack their target. The necessity for such a dangerous mission came only after all other attempts to halt the construction of the reactor failed. We concluded our, our assessment that we are going to have to act. Leaving him with very few alternatives, Begin reluctantly instructed his military commanders to begin planning Operation Opera. At the same time, Begin instructed the Mossad, Israel's famed secret service agency, to proceed with their own particular methods of delaying the construction. They decide to give uh, lessons uh, to prove that they can do things. And they did. <laughs> The Mossad had uh, found that the French were about ready to ship the core of the nuclear reactor to Iraq, and it was being stored at a warehouse in a French town on the Mediterranean. They put two charges of explosive uh, to uh, quote unquote destroy the place. It did not destroy it enough, though. It could be patched up, and Iraq decided to patch it up, but it took another six months, so they delayed it for another six months. The Mossad was also able to infiltrate the French Atomic Energy Commission and identified a top Egyptian nuclear scientist working for Saddam in Paris. In a scenario right out of a spy novel, the agents offered him sex, money, and power in exchange for information on the reactor. He was not interested in, in doing any business with them. So the Mossad decided to just take him out then. On Saturday, June 14th, 1980, Dr. Yahya El Meshed checked into the upscale Meridian Hotel in Paris. Mossad, bad guys, <laughs> uh, send an escort girl to the room of that poor guy. When he opened the door, they slit his throat. They didn't steal anything. Now, a prostitute had been in the hallway. She fled, but she contacted the police. And before she was able to be interviewed, a black Mercedes ran her over and then disappeared. So she was killed before she was able to say anything. Over the course of the development of the reactor, various news agencies reported that nearly a dozen nuclear scientists working on the project lost their lives. Many of the deaths were blamed on the Mossad. There were some successes all the way. I cannot refer to details, but it's been done. Despite the espionage, the murders, the sabotage, it was clear to the Israelis that nothing was going to stop Saddam from completing the construction of the reactor. There was a moment that the Mossad notified the Prime Minister that they had exhausted all of their resources. And at the moment this notice was received, it was clear it was a green light for the attack. After escaping Jordanian airspace apparently undetected, the eight F-16s enter Saudi Arabia airspace. Here, avoiding detection will be even more difficult. The Saudis have recently taken delivery on a fleet of AWACS spy planes from the U.S. that patrol Saudi Arabia continuously, searching for enemy encroachments. To further complicate matters, the landscape has changed drastically. Flying just 100 feet above the ground now becomes a challenging task, even for the most seasoned of the Israeli pilots, as they must negotiate the peaks and valleys that dot the topography. 
It is over Saudi Arabia that the squadron must execute the first of several never-before-tried dangerous maneuvers. What we did actually, we dropped the fuel tanks in the desert after being uh, using all the fuel, of course. This is something that uh, is not allowed to do in F-16, I, I think even today, because the wing tanks are very close to the bombs. And when you carry bombs on the wings, you cannot, you're not allowed to jettison the wing tanks until you get rid of the bombs. There was some concern whether the wing tanks would smash into the bomb or flip over the wing and damage the flaps. But indeed, they dropped them, and uh, these uh, 16 wing tanks are still there in the desert someplace even today. Dropping the wing tanks was the only maneuver the pilots had not practiced in their intensive training that had begun some 10 months earlier. It had the mission proceeded as originally planned, None of the eight pilots would have been over Saudi Arabia now, much less worrying about external fuel tanks. We didn't have F-16, and F-16 arrived only July 1980. Ivory's initial plan called for an armed incursion into Iraq, but a similar mission by the United States military to rescue the hostages in Iran was a complete failure, and one which forced the Israelis to rethink their plan. Before an alternative plan could be conceived, a seemingly unrelated event in the Middle East took place that set in motion a chain of fortuitous events for Israel. In 1979, fundamentalist Iranians overthrew the Shah of Iran. Prior to the coup, the Shah had ordered 76 new top-of-the-line F-16 fighter jets that now could not be delivered to the new hostile government. The State Department offered them to Israel. And of course, they, they immediately said, yeah. Uh, that then changed Ivory's thinking completely. The F-16s would require a new squadron made up of Israel's top guns. Ultimately, this elite group would be the ones to pilot the mission, though at the time, they were unaware of this distinction. The general they called me and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Raz. And they told us that he picked us uh, as the first commanders because we had an experience in, in air-to-ground missions. And he would like us to concentrate on air-to-ground missions. On the way back to our base from his office, we were wondering, what, is, what was that all about? Regardless of the directives, all the pilots were exhilarated to be chosen to initiate Israel's state-of-the-art fighter. It's cozy. It's built like a glove. It's built for the pilot. It was built by pilots. Much easier to fly than an F-15. A lot of thought for the pilot's ability to do a lot of things at the same time maneuver the airplane while uh, operating the radar systems, the, uh, the weapon systems. So it's a fighter pilot's fighter. It was only after the pilots had returned from their formal training in Utah that General Avery revealed the details of the mission to the group. Their reaction was as he expected. I was shocked because I didn't know that Iraq had a nuclear uh, program, let alone uh, uh, thought about getting to Baghdad, which was quite a distance away. It didn't cross our mind that there was anything like this. It was, uh, was a big map on the wall uh, with a small pin, southeast of Baghdad, and we were told that there is a nuclear reactor there. We thought that they are planning a mission to destroy it. Once the mission was revealed, the real training began. We had trained at flying at a very low altitude for a long time in a close formation, and the F-16 had special problems that had to be dealt with. The airplane was single, single engine, so we thought maybe a single engine. We used to fly on two engine, on the twin engine, and this is a single engine. How, what happened with the engine quit on us, but there's another engine in the seat, the, the ejection seat. 
route itself would take the pilots first over the southern tip of Jordan, then across northern Saudi Arabia, both sworn enemies of Israel at the time. After crossing the Saudi border into Iraq, the pilots would set a course straight for Baghdad. Because the mission would be over 1,200 miles in distance, the pilots had to figure out a way to train, simulating that distance while remaining in Israeli airspace. Israel still had part of Sinai, and uh, we could fly through Sinai down to Sharm el Sheikh and then even down into the Red Sea and come back. So we had to fly several times back and forth to simulate the range. The youngest of the F-16 pilots was a 26-year-old captain named Ilan Ramon, who will always be remembered as Israel's first astronaut, and was one of seven who perished in the space shuttle Columbia tragedy in 2003. Back in 1980, Ramon was eager to join the elite group of pilots and contribute his specialized skills to the mission. The first person I uh, shared this secret with was Captain Ilan Ramon. With his childish smile, told me that slightly out of range. Well, you can fly there, but you cannot land back in Israel. If you want to land in Jordan, then it's possible. Ilan Ramon was correct. Since mid-air refueling was not an option, the F-16s had to be modified and scaled down. This meant adding two additional fuel tanks, one under each wing, and eliminating everything but essential equipment, which in effect would make the aircraft defenseless. We didn't take with us any jamming pods, which are uh, for self-defense against uh, electronic measures, I mean, radars and so on. But from their perspective, they were like uh, flying ducks in some way. They did a mission and coming back home like flying ducks uh, and had to, without any capability to defend themselves. As the target date fast approached, the Mossad kept an eye on the progress of the reactor, utilizing top-secret U.S. spy satellites. The satellite access allowed Israel to monitor every detail of the construction. It grew from just this one dome-shaped reactor that the French sold them to a kind of a nuclear Oz. Many, many, many buildings, administration buildings of the chemical conversion uh, factory where they could transform the spent nuclear fuel into plutonium, uh, just everything. The photos revealed the facility had been impressively fortified with new batteries of anti-aircraft artillery and strategic surface-to-air missiles known as SAMs. Clearly, the situation in Baghdad had progressed faster than anyone could imagine. Then, on June 1st, the French newspaper Le Point reported that the construction of the reactor was complete. It would now only be a matter of months before the facility was fully operational. Five days later, Prime Minister Begin summoned General Ivry to his residence. The operation, he announced, will take place the day after tomorrow, Sunday, June 7th. Sunday, June 7th, 1981, was another typical summer day throughout Israel. From the holy city of Jerusalem to the modern metropolis of Tel Aviv, there was nothing to indicate this was going to be anything but just another Sunday. However, at Eight Zion, the secret Israeli airbase in the Sinai, June 7th was anything but typical. All of the pilots had reported to the base the day before, and now they were busy thoroughly inspecting each of the F-16s. When I did the round, uh, checking the airplane before that, I uh, all of a sudden felt myself touching the airplane and caressing it. You kind of want the airplane to have a personality in the sense that you may break uh, the next flight or the flight before, you may something may go wrong, but don't go wrong on me this time. The final briefing came later that morning. General Ivory addressed the squadron with rhetoric that left no doubt in the minds of the pilots about the enormity of the undertaking. And he said, okay, you guys, if you succeed, you will save Israel for eternity. 
And I told him, listen, there's one simple fact. They cannot stop us from getting there. I don't know if you can come back. They cannot stop us. After the briefing, the pilots had several hours to be alone with their thoughts and to contemplate what lay ahead. Amir Nakhumi, who would lead the second of two formations, was overwhelmed. There, when I, when I first felt the gravity of this mission, how heavy it is for us. I distinctly remember that I felt that um, Ilan Ramon, who was my wingman and myself, were going to be killed and couldn't share the information with my wife or anybody else. And uh, I remember that I came to peace with myself uh, on the day of the mission because uh, I'm named after my grandfather who had died in a concentration camp. And I felt that I'm flying for him. And uh, there was there's some calm in it that you know that there is a meaning to whatever happens to you. At exactly 1601, the pilots fired up their engines and taxied to the runway. In an attempt to carry as much fuel as possible, the jets underwent a very dangerous and precarious maneuver called hot refueling just prior to takeoff. It was something that has not been done before. We, we brought the, uh, the tankers to the runway. We just hooked, connected them to the end. While we were waiting for the, for, the, for the time to take off, we were topping up the airplane. I personally had a problem with fuel transfer. My airplane was not refueling. If you were not able to refuel, basically you weren't able to come back. Moments later, the squadron's technical officer gave the pilots the thumbs up signal. One of the major concerns for Zev Roz, who was the lead uh, pilot, was you know getting off the ground. And indeed, when they finally started taxiing down the runway, he wasn't gaining enough speed. As he was passing by these different markers where normally he, you'd be up and, uh, and heading off into the blue, he was still on the tarmac. He was afraid he was gonna run out of the uh, runway. Despite the burden of the heavy load, all eight of the F-16s lifted off and headed east. The mission was underway. Now, some 90 minutes later, the pilots were nearing a rocky airspace. I think as fighter pilots uh, and getting used to being scared, which is part of the job, um, you occupy yourself with the technicalities of flying. <laughs> So you're making sure that you're not flying into the ground. You can't talk to your buddies because there's a radio silence, electronic silence. Uh, but you have time to think um, and maybe even enjoy the, uh, the scenery a little bit to take your mind off uh, uh, what's going to happen. This was a, a terrain that we never flew above. This was a terrain well defended. At 17.35, the pilots passed the Euphrates River in western Iraq, the designated landmark to begin the bombing runs. Each pilot now accelerated their airspeed to 540 knots. And now flying at 50 feet becomes very difficult. So you really have to concentrate on your flying. And all you see is your buddy in front of you, and we were four pairs about three seconds apart. Miles away in Baghdad. Like in Israel, it was a very typical Sunday afternoon. Most people were enjoying the day off from work, including all the French technicians working at the reactor. And this was a detail that had not been overlooked by the Israelis. We decided, according to our assessment, that much less employees are going to be on, uh, at least French employees on Sunday, so we decided to make, to launch the attack on something.
The time the raid took place was also factored into the attack strategy. The timing was uh, a very good timing where a uh, change of guard takes place between day, day shift and night shift. Relic Shafir was right. Moments before the attack began, the Iraqi technicians who were manning the anti-aircraft artillery guns and the surface-to-air missiles had taken their dinner break. And now the adrenaline starts to flow. You make sure all your switches are on, everything is all set. You check and recheck, look at the wingman. Where the other guys are, look forward and wait for the fire to begin. Relic and the other pilots would have to wait for the anti-aircraft firing to begin. Because for some inexplicable reason, the guards at the reactor site had turned off the radar that could have intercepted the attacking F-16s. When we turned on the radars and we saw that there were no fighters over Baghdad, we were really surprised. We were surprised and in a way we were even disappointed. We expected them to be over Baghdad because the war was going on because we knew that they could see us f at least 15 minutes before. All the attention uh, was towards uh, east, and they didn't expect somebody coming from the west. The jets accelerated to 600 knots and pulled up to an altitude of more than 4,000 feet. With the target in sight, they were now ready to begin their dive. But as the jets screamed towards the target, Zev Ross discovered he had misjudged the dive point and would not be able to hit the reactor dome. So uh, Yadlin, his wingman, cut in underneath Ross and became the number one bomber instead of Ross. In the meantime, Ross did a loop-de-loop -loop with his plane and came in behind Yadlin. Yadlin and Ross dropped both of their bombs perfectly on target. After the bombing, go to low altitude, look for each other, you know, to cover each other and see if there are any mix, any enemy planes. <laughs> any surface to air missiles fired at us, we saw nothing. So then, after uh, something like, I think, two minutes of flying at low altitude, at high speed, we climbed to 40,000 feet. By the time Relic Shafir and Ilan Ramon made their run, the Iraqi guards had scrambled back to their posts and had opened fire. So you see every bullet, and each one of them, you have a feeling that it's for you. And now you're just locked into the target where you're going to put your pipper and uh, your gun sight. And all you care about is getting the airplane to the right spot to make sure that you have a good shot. And then the release point. Two tons get released from the airplane. You feel a lot lighter and you even feel like you got hit. And then there's a, a release of tension. Even though you're right above the target, you've accomplished the mission. Even if you get shot now, you've let the bombs go into the target. We were used to having raids because it was the Iran-Iraq war at the time. So every now and again, we'd have an air raid warning and um, planes would come over. But th this was very different. Um, there was just the explosion, no warning or anything. And then suddenly all the anti-aircraft fire went up. Of the 16 bombs that were dropped, each one had hit the target. Despite the failure of two of the bombs to detonate, the dome now lay in ruins, irrevocably destroyed. I was wondering if this is how it looks when it destroyed because I, don't see, I didn't see the dome anywhere. It was a lot of smoke, and it looks to me like a big hole in the ground. The combination of the large bombs, accuracy of the weapon system, and the skill of the pilots, that was good enough. First thing I thought, OK, we did it. And uh, all the fears, because what is the most fear of a pilot? is not to get killed, it's to blow the mission. Anybody who's into combat knows it's getting the mission done first, everything comes in second, especially if you're uh, in combat, a com combat pilot. With the target destroyed, the pilots now focus their attention on their next task, 
getting back alive and avoiding what they thought would be a certain encounter with Iraqi aircraft. But the Iraqis didn't play. They didn't uh, take off, they didn't uh, shoot missiles, didn't fire missiles, they even didn't uh, lock the radars on us. It was a big surprise for us that, uh, according to my long knowledge, not even one uh, SAM uh, missile was launched towards us. Even after the bombing, on the way back, 40,000 feet for more than more than 90 minutes. They didn't try to intercept us. Okay. And then we start, you know, chatting over the radio, and Ivory was, for the first time, I think, in the history, it just came over the frequency and said, guys, it's not, it's not done yet. You have to land. So shut up. Unabated by enemy Iraqi aircraft, the eight F-16s set their course for eight Zion Air Base and what pilots hoped would be an uneventful flight back. Now, it was just a matter of having sufficient fuel for the 600-mile trip. All of us came, came back, but with, with the, not the last drop, but very, very, very close to that. Minutes after the attack, Begin received a call from General Ivory. The bombing was a complete success. 90 minutes later, he received more good news. All the pilots had returned alive. Everything had gone as planned. The only miscalculation was Relic Shafir's prediction that he and Alain Ramon would not make it back alive. When I got out, Elon was uh, uh, in the next shelter, and we just hugged for about a minute, you know. Uh, didn't say a word, we just hugged each other for about a minute. If you touch someone, you know you are okay. You're alive. It was a great moment that uh, I cherished. Uh, I still cherish. The Iraqis were not the only ones surprised by the raid. It seemed the entire world was caught off guard. I really uh, think it was one of the most important and most uh, interesting military surprises of, of all time. I think the magnificence of the of the operation uh, was reflected in the fact that it had been under consideration for more than a year and that it had not leaked and that we were not able to penetrate Israeli intelligence to gain any heads up about uh, potentially uh, aggressive, if you call it aggressive, action against the reactor. President Ronald Reagan, whose relationship with Menachem Begin was both confidential and contentious, was shocked when he was notified. I said, Mr. President, uh, the Israelis have just taken out a reactor in Iraq using uh, F-16s. Uh, he said, they did what? And I said, well, repeated myself. And he said, you know what, Dick? And I said, what's that, Mr. President? He said, boys will be boys. The following day, the National Security Council convened in the Oval Office to formulate the official U.S. response to the raid. The president went around the table, and with the exception of one member of the cabinet, there was a very strong uh, anti-Israeli condemnation mood in the room. It was really rather uh, vitriolic, especially the vice president and Jim Baker. I was frankly amazed at the views that were expressed. The vice president, uh, George Bush, a longtime friend, was very vehement uh, in his criticism of, of the Israelis, uh, strongly urging that some sort of punitive action be taken. Uh, Jim Baker, the sec uh, chief of staff of the White House, was of the very same opinion. Then we finally got around uh, to me, and I said to the president, before this is over, we'll be on our knees thanking God Israel did what it did. As Israel had expected, the UN voted unanimously to condemn Israel for the attack. But despite demands from Vice President Bush and Arab nations for harsh sanctions against Israel, none was ever enacted. Israel has nothing to apologize for. We decided to act now before it is too late.
that we shall defend our people with all the means at our disposal. That's the, 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 the rule number one of Israel, uh, to protect and defend uh, his territory. So they did what they had to do. According to Van Gert, many in the French government, including Jacques Chirac himself, were privately relieved that Israel had taken this action, despite his public hyperbole to the contrary. Nobody uh, really uh, regret that bombing. The fact that this factory was destroyed uh, was not a bad deal for him, after all. He played his part. Saddam paid for the factory. Uh, Chirac fulfilled his contract. And boom. Politics aside, military experts from around the world were astounded by the boldness of the mission and the expertise in which it was executed. We got a lot of compliments by mainly military people, mainly defense people compliments us about it, but it was unformal. Under the table, they all blessed us. They all really praised us. They, they really didn't believe that we could do it. Military observers were also astonished by the absolute precision of the attack. Only the main target, the reactor, was destroyed. Adjacent buildings were left completely intact. There were only 11 casualties, 10 Iraqi soldiers and one French technician. And most of the casualties came as a result of the artillery, fired blindly into the sky by Iraqi soldiers as they waited for their radar to warm up. Most importantly, the nuclear fuel stored nearby was undamaged, precluding any potential nuclear radioactive contamination. Well, it was superbly done, and the, the men who did it were superb professionals. I thought it was absolutely stupendous. It, it was hard for me to imagine that this could have been done so expertly. It had to have been a long time in planning. It was performed brilliantly, nearly flawlessly. The condemnation of Israel was vociferous, but short-lived. But the Israelis accepted the criticism in exchange for what they saw as security from certain catastrophe. Israel put an end to his uh, nuclear ambitions. They had restored the balance of power in the Middle East and uh, neutralized a potential very violent dictator. It would be nearly a decade before the rest of the world understood the significance of the mission. In 1991, Saddam invaded neighboring Kuwait, which ultimately led to U.S. intervention and Desert Storm. Obviously, the history would have changed because Saddam Hussein being under pressure with a possible nuclear weapon would have acted differently with a lot more boldness and uh, I, I'm not sure that the United States would have acted the way it did, knowing that he has that kind of capability. After the victory in Desert Storm, David Ivory, then the Israeli ambassador to the United States, found out just how much the US military echoed those sentiments. Dick Cheney wrote a letter to David Ivory, and it was a photograph from the satellite of the destroyed reactor site. And below it, Cheney had written, if it weren't for you, Desert Storm wouldn't have been a success. We had felt at the time that we had the burden of keeping up the security of the Jewish people, not just the Israeli nation. And that was a genuine feeling that I think ran through our minds from day one of flight school. So it wasn't just a mission. It was uh, destiny. To destroy a strategic point or asset of the enemy, to come back safely, to do it without collateral damage, this is a wonderful example of what you can achieve with air power.